my dear students we are now in the very final master class 30 surgery quiz 2 today for the benefit of all you undergraduates facing the examination shortly i'm going to tell you people who have done my course regularly they know that they have uh, taken various chapters starting from dyspepsia through all the systems gi vascular breast hernia all in a various modules starting from sim surgery master class 1 to 28 now in the last two something like a post test actually the last with the 50 and now today with the 30 questions i'm going to tease you with some common questions if you are able to answer most of them at least 40 after 40 i mean the last time i said at least about 80 percent mark if you are able to score that is a good score that is for example today i am going to show you about 30 if you get 20 right you are there and if you are less than only 10 right that means you need to revise the module from module 15 to module 28 that is where all these questions have been taken from ok so i would request you if you are serious about our business i am serious i am sure you will be also you take a piece of paper and put your name and put alphabet from 1 to 30 and as I just give the questions you try to answer give your answer there and see my next slide will show you obviously the answer and you can correct yourself and judge yourself ok good luck let us go on quickly define flyer chest this is the question I have given you four options as you can see how will you define it is it fracture rib fractures rib fracture ribs or fractures ribs so that is little difference of singular plural but it makes lot of meaning and the right question answer as you all know by this time is fractures rib in other words more than two ribs at two or more places that is what very very important in other words it is a segment a chest wall when it is fractured because of some injury like a blend injury chest that part of the chest wall becomes like a fragment and uh, that will have this feature of fractures like this is what happened so what is the beauty of this fracture of two or more ribs at two or more places paradoxical movement what do you mean by paradoxical movement as you can see from this one whenever the patient takes deep inspiration instead of chest expanding like here the chest actually sucked in and uh, whereas during expiration as you can see here when you breathe out it bulges out in other words just opposite to what others are doing 80 percent of them are pulling one side and the segment is going to pull the other side so it is going to be functionally weaker chest so mechanical ventilation is going to be the requirement so this is the thing i am sure you all know the importance of the underwater seal in these people like here as you can see what do you mean by underwater seal icd underwater seal is the treatment of care for anybody with a major chest injury be it a traumatic hemothorax tension pneumothorax open pneumothorax or a flyer chest so what happens as you can see in this picture when you put a tube in the pleural cavity and the tube goes right inside the water so what happens when the patient is taking a inspiration and expiration you see what happens during expiration because of the positive pleural pressure in the pleural cavity as you can see so the air comes out like a bubble then as you can see in this one during inspiration the when the patient takes a deep inspiration there is a negative pressure so air wants to get in but it cannot because of the valve by the water so this is a very simple effective mechanism where we get this done now let us go to the question number two key aspects of ICD just now you saw an ICD being done how the ICD functions I have given you five options regarding ICD which one is a wrong statement can you find out from this place ICD through a triangle of safety incise along the lower border of the rib blunt dissection with the index finger is advisable bigger is a better drain connect to an underwater seal very simple but which one you think is not the right statement can you guess of course if you are good in anatomy you know this is the wrong answer ok because you need to incise along the upper border of the rib the reason is very simple as you can see here in this picture 
all the important things intercostal nerve and vessels are along the lower border of the rib so if you make an incision very close to the lower border there is a chance of injury and causes a traumatic hemothorax or even nerve injury for that matter so you do it carefully in the upper border next is triangle of safety all of you should understand it is above the fifth rib in between the pectoralis and also the latissimus muscle because it is less vas muscular easy to go in because if you see you can't go into the anterior chest wall so all these things are very practical important things on which only the questions are going to be addressed now coming to the question number 3 as you can see here what you see is ecchymosis just below if you can see this chap is having a ecchymosis just about 2 cm below the umbilicus so what is the diagnosis quite obvious it is a cullen sign but there are humpty number of cullen sign cullen sign is not pathognomonic of any particular pathology it could be any of this what is the most appropriate statement here tell me a b c d or e i would say it is all of the above because ectopic splenic rupture common cause for cullen sign pancreatitis we have seen few cases occasionally in elderly person due to leaking aortic aneurysm it does happen so all of the above so you need to know cullen sign per se will not help you to make a diagnosis but it is always a indirect sign of a major intra abdominal or retro peritoneal bleed or a catastrophe okay so this is another child with a cullen sign sometimes they can have also great turner sign that also you know so these are all the various signs you see in a splenic rupture as you can see enumerated all these things if you want to learn go to the module under sem surgery master class i am sure you'll get all these things clearly explained in another video lecture okay this is an another interesting patient we had okay this particular patient was a 40 year old elderly person after few weeks before he had a road traffic accident came with the dyspnea and the x ray was little conflicting i mean it is curious x ray so we did a ct where you see the coronal and the sagittal section as you can see here and it is too much for as an undergraduate i know but what is important here is to for you to understand here for example what you see here is a liver and here on the liver it's like a cap it is having a small portion of the liver is actually herniated to the chest what do you see is a black they all the lung side okay these are all lung and you can see this liver it is herniating the dome okay because of the rupture of the dome of the right dome of the liver so this is the picture normally given and that is the ruptured right dome of diaphragm so right diaphragmatic hernia very rare form of traumatic hernia this gives you a classical finding that is called the british cottage loaf sign this is the cottage loaf of british and this is the way it look like the liver herniating portion that's why the name is given but all of you should know at least this one concept whenever a patient is comes with a blind injury abdomen chest especially when they are dyspneic consider especially when you do a chest x ray look for diaphragmatic hernia traumatic 90% of the people will have like here is a left side okay the elevated dome of diaphragm on the left side is a very classical thing okay there may be a fundus side of below but whenever there is an elevated dome there are only two reasons one is a ruptured diaphragm or eventration of diaphragm but in a trauma setting elevated diaphragm is a ruptured diaphragm unless proved otherwise and there are other corroborative evidences you will see a patient in addition to dyspnea there will be absence of breath sounds on the left side especially when you just auscultate sometimes even you can hear some bubble sounds and the heart also push to the right mediastinal sip will be there what we call a pseudo dextrocardia so these are all the triad in case of a diaphragmatic rupture mostly on the left side the one cottage lobe is from the right side liver herniating okay and this is by the way one of the barium we have done in a different patient where you can see the bowel loops are getting into the left chest and again a ct is much more evident here you can see the liver but if you see the left side you can see the herniation sometimes even spleen and everything gets in the way so it settles when the patient is going for a laparotomy where you can see the ruptured diaphragm as you can see here is nicely sewn here and through which the bowel has gone so reduce all the bowel repair it if necessary with a suture or even a mesh 
So that's a treatment, that is a different thing. But recognized as a resident or as a final year, raised dome of diaphragm is a ruptured diaphragm unless proved otherwise. Okay. Can you? This is another case of trauma and a blunt injury chest. A patient is coming with hypotension, JVP raised, and if you auscultate, hardly any heart sounds, S1 and S2, because muffled heart sounds. So, there is a classical triad because of some unusual pathology sometime you encounter. Any idea? Question number 5. Yes, if you said it is a cardiac tamponade because of bleeding into the pericardial cavity causing what we call a Beck's triad. That is Beck's triad. There are about 10, 15 triads and uh, I mean 10 or 15 syndromes and about 20 or 30 signs. All these things you have to master as undergraduate and uh, keep them all in a vocabulary in your own. Okay? So, here is a that is a classical case of Beck's triad. This is another rare case of a chest x-ray again a driver of a car and wearing a seat belt had a sustained injury he was having a severe retrosternal pain and when we did an x-ray this is what we find. What is staring at you? Can you make a guess what could be the reason? This patient was very dystonic, a lot of pain and also he had a high BP in the upper limb and hardly I mean a low very low BP and femoral pulses on both sides were very weak. So, any guess? If you made a diagnosis, yes it is a widened mediastinum as you can see the mediastinum wide, very wide. There are only few causes for widened superior mediastinum, retrosternal goiter, aortic aneurysm, lymphoma or teratoma in that region plus in a trauma setting especially it was not there yesterday, today after accident it happened think of thoracic aortic rupture. So, transaction of thoracic aorta because the arch of the aorta is becoming a descending aorta that area yeah, mobile and fixed part going for transaction. So, that is just below the left subclavian artery. So, it can have this particular appearance. So, be aware of that. So, these are all the rare life threatening conditions have to be diagnosed both clinically you suspect radiologically you have. Okay. Coming to the next question number 7. I have made some statement regarding the role of ultrasound in blend injury abdomen. Will you do an ultrasound in all blend injury abdomen? And if so, I am just I will read it for you. It can be done as a bedside even in an unstable patient. That is why ultrasound is better than a CT. Number 2, you can make a quick diagnosis of fluid or blood in the peritoneal cavity, pericardial cavity and the pleural cavity. And it can help you to assess any solid visceral injury like liver, spleen, kidney. It helps you to diagnose perforated viscous. So, I made a four statement. One is actually wrong. Which one you know? Yes, it is a viscous injury because air leak from the perforated viscous may not be easily perceptible. CT is good in that number D, but ultrasound is helpless there. So, fast scan, what we call a fast scan, all of you should know, is a focused assessment with a sonography for trauma that is called a fast scan. It is quite useful because of its, uh, it can be wheeled into the emergency room, but the one or two limitation is it will miss the hollow viscous injury and also it will not show whether the patient is actually bleeding, active bleeding cannot be estimated. You can tell approximately this quantum of bleeding, but it is he still bleeding if that question has to be addressed clinically or radiologically. Clinically, of course, BP, pulse, urine output, CVP will help you, but uh, radiologically you need to go for a contrast CT that is the best investigation for that. But if the patient is unstable, take him right to the theatre. Okay. So, fast scan where all we do, this picture will tell you the four common places where the surgeon or whoever is there in the emergency room will keep perihepatic to look at the liver, pericardial to look at the pericardial cavity perisplenic to see is any bleeding or injury to the spleen or a hematoma in that region, pelvic to see any pelvic collection of fluid or blood. So, very quick takes few minutes only. Okay. Coming to this question number 8, I have given you 4 conditions here, all of them are postal hypertension with esophageal varices, take it from me. And what out of them, one 
will have a better prognosis. For example, if you have a case, four different cases of pole hypertension, which one of the four will be uh, having a better longevity, better prognosis or higher chance of survival when they bleed torrentially or where they go into various complications. Is it chronic liver disease due to alcoholism, Wilson's disease, Bhatshari, splenic vein thrombosis. You may be wondering, little too much for you, it is a difficulty level 4 because most of my questions today is going to be difficulty level 2 or 3, but this is one for a smart guys. Okay? And splenic vein thrombosis with the pole hypertension is one, usually we have a very good prognosis because all of you by this time should know the various causes for pole hypertension, prehepatic, hepatic, pre and post sinusoidal and post hepatic. And if you see all the causes given below that yellow line, they are more serious because there whenever the patient has any complication like a upper GI bleeding, they usually they do very badly because they do not have any liver cell function like alcoholic liver disease or Bhatshari syndrome. Whereas, if you have only splenic vein thrombosis, those above that line as you can see above that line, the, those people the liver as such is functioning ok. So, they will not have any mortality and usually they do reasonably well. So, that is an important thing, but I am sure at your level as an undergraduate may be difficult to comprehend, but soon you will learn the importance of the etiology to say about the prognosis in pole hypertension. Okay. So, this is what we say the liver cell failure if a patient is going in it is a poor prognosis and who they go it is only people with the cirrhosis or bachari more than the prehepatic causes. Here I have given you four few causes for lower GI bleeding. First of all do you know what is upper GI bleeding and lower GI bleeding by definition? Any bleeding from GI tree above the ligament of treats upper GI below that if it is a small bowel or a large bowel can be considered as a lower GI bleeding. So, what could be the cause? I have given you six causes here. One is actually an upper GI cause, it is not a lower GI cause. Can you find out? Yes, is it Meckel's, C A cecum, interception, C A rectum, diverticulosis all are lower GI pathology as you know. Whereas, Mallory base is a problem in the lower end of the esophagus or around the cardia of the stomach. Okay. So, that is the wrong odd one out in this case. Next one coming to the causes for the bleeding I told you these are all the this picture again reiterate what are the common causes in the intestine like uh, it is all depends upon the age group and also the for example, if an elderly person with a lower GI bleeding you think of a malignancy or even a diverticular disease or angiodysplasia. If it is the same thing lower GI bleeding like bright red blood in a child of 2 years age then you think of Meckel's diverticulum. The rule of 2 you know Meckel's diverticulum present in 2 percent of us. Okay. It is about 2 feet away from the ileocecal junction wherein in 2 percent of the people it may have parietal cell hyperplasia and because of that peptic ulcer there and giving you a hot spot in a radioisotope technetium scan and also it can bleed like a hell like this patient. Okay. Coming to the next common thing causes for GI bleeding in a known alcoholic. You imagine tomorrow you are in the emergency department a patient with a known alcoholism brought in with a hematemesis or melina. What is melina? Tory black stool. Okay. So, in that condition what are the common conditions which usually seen in a patient with alcoholic. I have given you here again yet another six different reasons why a person can bleed with the one exception which is the wrong or odd one out. Fontal varics, gastritis, esophageal varices, portal gastropathy, leomyoma and malary bees. Out of them the one thing odd one out in this patient is leomyoma of the stomach. So, that is the thing because malary V tear can happen because other things are easy to comprehend. For example, gastritis because of alcoholism, esophageal varices, portal gastric gastropathy, frontal varices because of the portal hypertension because of alcoholic liver disease. Malary V tear because of alcoholism patient can have a retching because of that there will be mucosal tear in the lower end just above the OG junction the scomo columnar junction that can also present as a bleeding. 
whereas leomyoma can happen to anybody so that is the odd one out ok. Next let us go into the next chapter that is regarding the amoebic liver abscess. I have given you some classical features of amoebic liver abscess one is a wrong answer. Amoebic liver abscess is common younger age group common in alcoholic it usually present as a multiple abscess in the liver. First culture usually there is sterile there is no bacteria grown metronidazole is a treatment of choice. So, 5 which one you think is the wrong in this relevant to the amoebic liver abscess yes it is usually rule of 80, 80 percent of the amoebic liver abscess happens in the right lobe, 80 percent of them are single solitary that is what you should know multiple abscesses are wrong answer ok. Coming to the sonographic feature as you can see here normally this is the way it look it is common in right side because ileocecal region drained by the superior mesenteric way in territory. So, it will be and usually it is subhepatic that is why rupture is so common and the classical presentation ok. And when you aspirate an amoebic liver abscess is the next common thing as a clinician or as a CRRA you will be knowing, but even in neat exam they might ask you the following are the indication for amoebic liver as I mean abscess aspiration except. So, I have given you 5 different reasons the size of the abscess, impending rupture, no clinical response, superadded infection, elderly with the liver abscess which one is odd one out. Yes, elderly with a liver abscess because whether it is elderly or young that itself age per se is not an indication for aspiration ok. And as you know this is usually done under ultrasound guidance if you go you see a classical ankavi sauspus. So, aspiration is indicated especially when you have a large abscess with the following indication as I just enumerated in the previous slide ok. Coming to the next thing you might have read in our SEMS surgery master class and the thing is regarding the pharmacotherapy for a bleeding esophageal varices presenting with hematemesis melina in a case of a alcoholism with a portal hypertension. What drugs you will use? I have given you 5 drugs here one of them not specifically reduces the portal pressure ok which is one can you find out. So, I have given you 5 drugs I will give you 5 seconds to see. Yes, it is D. Pantoprazole is a PPI. It is given intravenously in a case of upper GI bleeding due to ulcer or gastritis, not for not esophageal varices. So, other four things reduces this planktonic circulation, reduces the portal pressure, and especially the terlipressin or a somatostatin infusion are the two drugs commonly given for people in a known case of actively bleeding esophageal varices. So, here is a small picture I think I am sure you may be able to recollect this particular slide especially if you remember when we discussed that is treatment of bleeding varices is both by intervention with an endoscopy by using what we call the banding sclerotherapy or a glue injection. And also in a patient when you are waiting for the endoscopist to arrive then you may have to consider like what I am given here for example is a pharmacotherapy ok. So, that is what you need to see and the TIPS is a procedure that is again they will ask you sometimes what is TIPS procedure. TIPS is nothing but trans intrahepatic portal systemic stent that is you have to go trans jugularly through the jugular vein then you get into the right side of the heart get into the IVC get into the hepatic vein and hepato portal sy systemic stent you are able to do. So, you can see the diagrammatic representation of the stent and that immediately dramatically reduces the portal pressure that will be sometimes what we call a rescue procedure in a patient who is not settled either with the pharmacotherapy or with the banding. So, that is again can be asked and endocrinology especially Graves disease, multinodal goiter, solitary nodule important questions for you. Here is a Graves disease how you suspect a Graves disease patient remember this 6 T's that is they will have a diffuse goiter, terrifying eyes that is exophthalmus, tremor like this a fine tremor, then tachycardia or a palpitation, then pre-tibial non-pitting edema, then they will have a low TSH, 
high T4 T3. So, this is a classical feature of Graves disease and I have given you 5 signs here and what are the I signs of Graves disease and one is a wrong one. Can you tell me which one is a not a I sign of thyrotoxicosis? Yes, Hill sign is something to do with the aortic incompetence whereas all other 4 signs as you can see enumerated here nicely you need to go back to the slide we discussed when we discussed thyroid about the various things like a Geoffroy sign, Stelvok sign, Dalrymple sign, Mobius sign, even a one graph is sign. Like for example, if you bring the like that your finger to the tip of the ask the patient to look at his tip of the nose, the convergence of the eye is difficult for him. So, that is what we call a Mobius sign like that various signs can be elicited, but usually they are all academic because exalthalmus by looking at the patient if you see if you are able to see the upper part of the sclera the white of the eye is able to see because of the lid retraction that is diagnostic and the people will ask you what is exophthalmus what is proptosis. So, you have the answer with you right ok. Coming to the next thing thyroid nodule whenever there is a solitary nodule thyroid they will ask you a question what is a cold thyroid nodule I have given you 5 cases here out of them one is actually hot thyroid it is not a nodule. So, which one is it? So, if you see this A, B, C, D and E the answer yes Graves disease will have a diffuse uptake of iodine radioactive iodine. So, A, B, C and E are cold nodule where the blue color is given the red areas are the iodine avid whereas the blue area is the area where iodine is not taken up ok. And these are all the few causes as you can see common causes colloid nodule is the commonest cause follicular adenoma even hazematosyriditis when it is a nodular portion carcinoma always they fear carcinoma, but not all cold nodules are carcinoma that is what the message I want to drive ok. Coming to the next question you may be asked in the viva what you mean by orphan aninuclei in which condition you see I have given you 5 conditions which one you think is the right is it a thyroid pancreas or ovarian or it is in all cases what do you think yes it is a classical finding is in a papillary carcinoma thyroid as you can see in this picture you can see a the empty nucleus the nucleuses are chromatin are pushed to the periphery the nuclei look very empty like this clear vacuolated nuclei that is very classical of papillary CA that is why it is called orphan anne according to the American cartoon character with the empty eyes ok. Even the dog along walking along with the orphan anne will have a that character. So, there is a classical cartoon character on that basis the empty or clear vacuolated nucleus is given that appearance ok. Question number 17 uh, ventral hernia or abdominal wall hernia can happen in various situations and I have given you a question mark where there is a green shadow. What is the name of the hernia normally appear in that particular position? Can you tell me because you know where you will expect an epigastric hernia, umbilical hernia, even a femoral hernia below the pubic tubercle ok. Above the pubic tubercle you see the inguinal hernia all those things we discussed in the hernia module again you go back to our same master class when you have a time in YouTube. So, the question there is spigelian hernia. So, you need to know what is a spigelian hernia and read something about a spigelian hernia ok. Can you name this hernia an inguinal hernia where you see this particular thing what we call a, a Meckel diverticulum ok. So, you can see a Meckel diverticulum here and also in this picture here in the diagrammatically. So, this is Litter's hernia how to remember because always there is a confusion. So, Meckel it ends with the L. So, you L for L so Litter's hernia you remember that because M ions hernia is where appendix A for A. So, that is the way you should remember ok. Let us go on to the question number 19 ok. I am sure you are following me watch closely there are about 11 more questions only I am sure you are doing already well. 
I am sure you have seen and remember this particular thing when we discussed about the, the radiology and also when I discussed about the sigmoid valvulus. So, what is the name of this sign? Can you name the sign which normally is a classical radiological sign in sigmoid valvulus? Yes, if you say it is what we call an inner tube sign, coffee bean sign is ok, but what I required from you is called a Freeman doll sign. What do you mean by Freeman doll? As you can see, if you see the three margins, see the convergence of this to that yellow star that is converging three linear lines to the site of obstruction. So, that is what we call the Norwegian radiologist described as a Freeman doll sign. So, these are all the indirect signs. So, this is what we normally say the here for example, you see the as if a big cycle tire is inside. So, because of the anticlockwise rotation of the sigmoid as a sigmoid valvulus one of the common valvulus you see day in and day out in a patient elderly people with a chronic constipation ok. And this is another sign worth knowing a beware of a 2 year old boy presenting with the intermittent pain and also diarrhea sometimes colicky abdominal pain with the spells of cry ok. Whenever you feed the child the child will be crying. So, when you examine this is what you see there is some mass just above the umbilicus as a red arrow shows here and also if you feel the right leg fossa there will be some emptying. So, I am sure by this time you might have guessed the question answer yes if you say it is a sign D dance or we call dance sign of intersusception. So, that is the thing. So, balance sign spleen intersusception sign dance sign. So, these are all McBurney sign appendix like that there are some common signs you should know. And also you should know by this time what is meant by intersusceptum, intersuscipient. So, intersusceptum, septum. So, that means it is what is going inside that is ileum is intersuscepting. So, that is the intersusceptum, intersuscipient that is a colon which is a receiving. So, the receiving part is called intersuscipient. So, that is a word the spelling for everything is very very important for an undergraduate ok. This is a patient with the hundreds of polyps in the large intestine and he is showing his teeth and what is the diagnosis? The last I am sure the module 29 if you go we showed you another patient with the similar picture, but lots of pigmentation in the lip there you nicely diagnose as a pew Jagger syndrome. So, this is not a pew Jagger syndrome this is with the extra teeth you have 32 teeth all of us, but he has two more that is a super numerated teeth is very classical finding as you can see is a Gardner syndrome. So, Gardner syndrome I am sure you will know the features desmoid tumor, osteoma, epidermoid cyst, super numerary teeth and also the retinal changes. So, these are all the classical features of the Gardner syndrome and already I think you have seen in the last class about the how a Turcotte syndrome will present with the brain tumor. So, all these things are very common viva questions ok. Here is one scar in the right subcostal region for a patient can you name the operation or the name the scar because if a patient comes and you are taking a history especially after a few years or few months after surgery. By looking at the scar you should be able to tell what operation patient might have undergone because some patients are clever enough to tell you the diagnosis some you need to guess. So, here is a answer that is a cocker incision as you can see number 1 here. So, midline incision, McBurney incision all the incision I have given you here you please carefully you see this picture and try to memorize all these incisions and when you see next time patient with the incision that tell you what operation patient might have gone, whether the wound has healed nicely and how the surgeons close the wound, what material he might have used lot of messages or information you gather just by a fraction of second you spend time looking at the scar ok. Coming to the question number 23, now here is a young boy as you can see with a history of trauma few weeks before coming with the huge abdomen you can see the upper abdomen above the umbilicus is quite swollen and you see a classical finding a CT scan you see a, a fluid filled structure ok right there in the occupying almost the whole of the abdomen. So, this is a classical presentation of what I call a traumatic pseudo pancreatic cyst. So, this is the CT appearance of pseudo pancreatic cyst which is actually pushing the stomach so anteriorly stomach is hardly seen here ok. 
So, these are all the 5 masses I am going to tell you and what are the masses moves with respiration this is a very simple question ok. This is actually 5 different masses you sometimes see when you examine a patient out of them one is not moving with the respiration. Can you tell me which one liver, spleen, kidney or pseudo system pancreas or mucosal of gall bladder because if you are not sure you go back to the module we have discussed in the abdominal masses in the same master class I am sure you will find the answer there. But here is the answer for you today that is pseudo system pancreas because all other things as you can see here like liver, gallbladder mass, spleen as the stars they are showing you they have a direct relationship with the diaphragm. So, they move easily or freely with the respiration whereas pancreas no that is a very important thing and a pseudo pancreatic cyst you have to identify this. And I have given you some other in addition to pancreas any retroperitoneal mass especially aortic aneurysm lump like a aneurysm of aorta or lower abdominal or ovarian cyst they also is not going to or not expected to move with the respiration. So, that is a very very important clinical thing nowadays we do not give that much important to the clinical examination, but still as a undergraduates your job to properly examine person and I am sure the examiner will appreciate your hard work. I have given you five some causes of splenomegaly out of 4 out of the 5 they are known to have umbilic I mean the spleen as you can see in this particular lady extending even below the level of the umbilicus large or huge spleen which are the conditions what is the exception A, B, C, D, E which is the odd one out here. I will just wait for you 3 more seconds just to give an answer that is idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura that is a very important condition for a bleeding tendency, but there usually the spleen is quite small whereas other conditions you can see a massive spleen especially one in CML or a myelofibrosis ok. Coming to something about the renal mass here is a question number 26 I have given you some characteristics of renal mass you just to see it one of them is actually a wrong concept it moves with the respiration does it by manually palpable not able to insinuate hand between the mass and the costal margin bellotability and does not cross the midline all are true except C yes the C is the one unique for only one organ that is spleen because only in spleen you will not be able to insinuate because spleen is very close to the costal margin. Whereas, if it is a retroperitoneal or if it is a pancreatic or a renal mass you will be able to insinuate your hand. So, that is a wrong one in this case. So, that is the thing you are expected to tick in your egg ok. Coming now next to the very important module we discussed in detail is a neck swelling and also the thyroid in a two different module in a same surgery class go and read if you are not able to recollect today, but let us address few questions the last three questions. Here are the few conditions where in the neck which easily moves with the declaration you give a patient a glass of water and see when they just to swallow the water whether the swelling is moving with the declaration which one will not is it A, B, C, D or E any guess it is a one of the easy question I would say yes that is a dermoid cyst because dermoid cyst as you know it has no attachment either to the pretracheal fascia or like thyroid which is attached to the berries ligament why swelling in the neck moves with the declutition if anybody asks you either they are attached to the pretracheal cervical fascia or they are attached indirectly by a berries ligament. So, that is the reason ok and a cystic swelling see whenever you see any swelling anywhere in our body especially in the neck you have to see the consistency whether it is a soft cystic hard something like that. So, here I have given you 6 different causes one of them is not a cystic swelling all other are 5 different cysts. Any guess quickly you go through A, B, C, D, E, F yourself any guess yes solitary nodule solitary nodule is usually the commonest is either a colloid nodule or it is a case of follicular adenoma or even a carcinoma. So, most of them are either firm 
or even a hard consistency. So that is our odd one out. All other things usually I have given you in a schematically in a colorful diagram. I am sure you might have remember this picture various midline lateral cystic swelling even a cystic hygroma which is a brilliantly translucent posterior fossa I mean uh, fossa you can see a uh, posterior triangle tumor ok. And here is a last two cases here is a patient with a swelling in the submandibular region. Whenever you have a swelling in the submandibular triangle there are only two conditions either is a salivary gland or a lymph node how are you going to make a diagnosis ok. Because basis of this particular thing I will give you a clue the lymph nodes are superficial to the mylohyoid muscle whereas the salivary gland has a superficial portion and a deep portion. So, I am sure you now you guess what I am asking for the best to test is a clinical test do not say it is an ultrasound clinically you can make a diagnosis by doing this particular thing as you can see here by digital palpation yes you put gloves and by digitally you just go one in the oral cavity other outside and you will be able to feel with the one finger inside one finger outside you will be able to appreciate the diagnosis. So, that is what because this is a very very important very busy slide very very important one test for each condition like what I started here for example submandibular salivary gland by digital palpation and what is the other thing I have given you the parotid swelling lifting of ear lobe thyroid swelling number 3 moving with the declutition thyroglossal cyst moving with the protrusion of the tongue branchial cyst it is along the anterior border in the upper one third and the lower two third dermoid cyst a midline swelling carotid body tumor carotid triangle pulsatile tuberculous lymphadenopathy multiple mating lymphoma rubbery consistency secondary is hard consistency like that I have given you the key elements. So, I am sure if you have this confidently you can make a diagnosis of neck swelling ok. The last one is the best one what is the diagnosis uh, if is a usually young boy as you can see is having a swelling not only in the chin region that is submental region, but also in the intra orally. So, what is the diagnosis a bluish discolored submucosal swelling underneath the tongue ok. It is not that common nowadays sometimes they go into the oral surgeon or a dental surgeon any guess if you made a diagnosis of plunging ranula then you are absolutely right yes plunging ranula is because ranu that is a frog like a frog's belly it is a bluish discoloration is plunging into the submantle region is a very classical finding and if you know that is well and good and this is the price question for all of you whenever you have a patient especially having had or known case of a advanced intraabdominal malignancy presenting with a small nodule in the umbilicus you suspect a case of as you can see in the CT in this picture secondaries that is because of this sister Joseph nodule see this is sister Joseph. So, you remember sister Joseph who was working as a staff nurse under William Mayo in Mayo clinic. So, that is the, the final thing as I said like a plunging analog we also like a frog jumping from an undergraduate final year into CRRI then progress even like a tortoise slow and steady with a motive of becoming a very good surgeon and a very bright future is waiting for you. So, I am sure you go repeatedly see all our modules you will be there and any problem we are always we are all there at our block I am sure you will be communicating all with our new blocks new teaching mechanisms and until that time until I meet you next time good luck Jai Hind bye bye.